Awesome. So um, my talk topic today is beyond copy paste agile uh, with the subtext of uh, the missing links between strategy and operations. Cool. So let's get started. Uh, how many of you know where this is? Does anybody know this beautiful city? I know Jose knows. Uh, and those uh, JP knows, of course, Kat knows, because we've had some conversation. Uh, Pavel, where is this? Unmuting is a challenge. Uh, South Africa, Johannesburg. It's correct country. Uh, it is, however, Cape Town, South Africa. So this is actually uh, my home city. Uh, very close. Uh, it's still worth visiting. Joburg is also fantastic. Um, but this is Cape Town, South Africa. I started my career here. Uh, originally in product management in telecoms uh, and my expeditions into all things agile uh, kind of begin on this side of the world. Uh, hanging out in the sun, nice and blue, uh, everything fantastic. The wine is wonderful and very cheap. Uh, and then someone met me and suggested I should come hang out here. Although the picture doesn't suggest it, uh, the pitch was basically come live in the cold and darkness uh, and see what you think. Does anyone know where this city is? Yes, oh, Maria knows the city. It is <laughs> Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, so I was very lucky to be able to join Spotify in the relatively early days. Uh, I spent about four and a half years at the company and some of my stories over the course of today uh, and some of my thinking around uh, the things I'm going to talk to you today certainly framed and founded uh, in some of my experiences there. Um, yeah, crazy journey. When I joined, we were 700 people. Four and a half years later, when I left, we were 5,000. Uh, in the same time period, we went from 10 million customers to 210 million customers. Uh, just absolutely ludicrous numbers. It's hard to even make sense of it. Um, but yeah, if you have heard of Spotify, uh, you've probably also heard of people using things like the Spotify model. Uh, and so I want to tell you a little bit of a story before I start. Um, so the story goes that a young kid is watching their parents uh, cooking some dinner. Uh, and for those of you who have kids or spend time around kids, you will know that kids love to ask uh, a certain question uh, almost on repeat. So as they're busy cooking, uh, they note, the kid notices that the parents cut a little bit off the top and the bottom of the chicken. And the kid, of course, goes, why? Why, why do you do this? And they sort of look at each other a little bit confused. They realize, actually, we don't know. We just learned this from our parents. So... To make a, a fairly long story a little bit shorter, essentially they ask the parents, they don't know either, they learned it from their parents. So they go and ask the grandparents uh, and they find out that basically this was quite an amusing thing for the grandparents because they laugh and they said, well, my dears, when we got married, uh, we didn't have so much money. We couldn't afford a very big oven. Our pan was obviously therefore quite small. And so the only way to fit the chicken in the oven was to cut a piece off the top. Now. The reason I tell you the story is because I see this happening so often in organizations, not just with the Spotify model. Uh, we copy Facebook and Google and whoever else. Uh, basically, we look at what everybody else has done before us and we assume that it must make sense. However, I would put to you that many of these situations are actually a little bit more like the parents copying the chicken from their parents. The reasons that we did those things do not necessarily make so much sense. The other part of this, of course, is that really what I think is important is if you want to be able to do the stuff effectively, you need to be able to have some perception of what's happening inside your organization. So understanding the reality of what is capable and what's possible is almost more important, I think. So for those of you who have interviewed at a company or certainly dealt with any company through their sales cycle, probably you get a little bit of a pitch like this. They perceive themselves as the new shiny, everything is fancy and so on. The reality is, however, sometimes perhaps different. Now, for some of you, you might think that this is actually a better scenario. Um, I'm getting the feedback again. I don't know where it's coming from. Cool. Um, so you might see this and kind of go, well, actually, this is a much better cooking experience. Uh, but the challenge, however, could be that you may be more likely in this scenario and sometimes perhaps even in this situation. Now, the challenge with this uh, is, of course, that we need to ask this question, well, why is the perception important? Well, quite shortly, uh, what works for a pizza oven won't work on a hob, right? The capabilities and possibilities are quite different. 
So I want you to keep this in your mind as we're trying to explore this question of how do we move beyond copy paste agile, where we just grab things from everybody else, don't necessarily engage too much with what are the actual challenges and capabilities that we face in our organizations. So I want to explore this through the idea of three lenses, right? Systems, science, and sapiens. And I'll unpack each one a little bit as we go. So first up, we have systems. Now, some of you may have heard of the concept of flight levels, a uh, slight bit of self-promotion in woven in here, but it is a core thinking model that I have used since long before I was involved with this organization, uh, both at my time at Spotify and prior work as well. Uh, but the idea here is that we're really talking about interactions between the flight levels, and that will make more sense uh, as I continue through the talk. So if you're feeling a little bit tired of this scenario, being dragged from one point in the organization to another, just absolute chaos, everything is kind of on the go, uh, and you don't necessarily make sense of this, uh, I, I kind of put to you that part of why we end up in this situation is because I think a lot of what we actually do uh, as leaders and individuals in the organization is to look at this picture and not just see high utilization, but to look at the gaps between the cars and think there's actually still some space. We can for sure fit some more things in here, right? So how does this happen? Well, a typical team board is you end up in this situation here. Right, we have something like some work on the go. And the question that we ask is what happens when the work lands in done? And of course, as we dig a little bit, we find out that there is something like waiting for integration, maybe even some acceptance testing and possibly even some waiting for release. If you don't work in a technical space, but usually there's something else that happens beyond the work of your individual team. And of course, as we know, these things don't happen in the same cycle that we finish our work. It could be monthly or yearly, uh, or in this case, even quarterly. Now, at this point, luckily we do reach done, but if we go the other way and we ask the question, well, where did this work come from? The reality is that as we start to zoom out, we see that there are quite a lot of steps as we go all the way back to this idea and steering committees and where does the work even come from? And once we look and we zoom out and we see this full picture, we start to kind of wonder a little bit about why are we focusing on making this part super agile when the entire flow is extremely, extremely long, right? So to put it another way, the black dots, those little marks there, those are the ones where we do the work. The other ones, that's just waiting for somebody else to do a thing. So if we want to tackle this, how would we tackle this situation? Well, if you look at something like this, basically what you're seeing is a visualization of the end-to-end -end flow. You can see where the idea starts. You can see where it starts to yield some value. And if we're trying to manage for flow across this level, we see something entirely different than trying to tackle this within an individual team. No point being super fast in the development stage if this is only a few days or weeks of our entire end-to-end -end flow. So the first point that I would like to, put, to highlight for you is to visualize your end-to-end -end flows all the way from vision to value or from concept to cash. This is really, really important. Next up, I want to tell you a little bit of a story. So the other part of the challenge that I think so often in the organization is that when we're doing some work, uh, typically what we've done is organized ourselves in all the teams of uh, different things. So this story is borrowed straight from Klaus Leopold, who is uh, the, one of the other co-founders of the Flight Levels Academy. Uh, so if you've seen this story before, forgive me a little bit of repetition, uh, because I think this illustrates the point so wonderfully, and I haven't been able to come up with a better way myself. So the scenario is basically a customer wants a love letter. They come to us and they say, please, will you create this for us? Now, the challenge that we have is that our teams are organized basically on the rows of the keyboard, right? So each team is responsible for one part of the letter. The challenge, however, is that as the organization grows, we tend to divide ourselves into even smaller, more specialized teams, each with their own specialized function. So now at this point, the challenge becomes not so much pushing uh, a key as fast as humanly possible, because a letter full of A keys is not really a very useful love letter, unless you happen to be from some foreign planet or speak some other language. Uh, but I've yet to find some letter that doesn't make sense if you're not using a combination of letters. The reality is that what we need here is the right team doing the right thing at the right time, right? And the way that we do this is really by feedback loops 
between the different parts of the organization. We need to connect the pieces. Remember, we're talking about systems here. So how does this work? In a flight levels world, essentially what we do is we think about the organization in three layers or three levels of granularity, each with their own different time horizon. This is not about the hierarchy or your status in the organization. We're just looking at the organization through three different lenses. So quite granular and small at the operational level. This is where the work is usually done. Something actually happens on the ground. Level two is about coordination across all of these teams, right? So slightly longer range, maybe bigger chunks of work. And at the top, we have strategy. The direction, where are we going? And basically what we're trying to do is connect strategy to operations so that what we do makes sense strategically, but also the strategy is coherent with the reality of our operations. So the reality is that almost always in an organization, or even if we just picked three people, and we will explore this concept quite a bit, what we have is we have three different viewpoints on essentially the same scenario, right? So we see slightly different things depending on where we sit or where we spend most of our time, our cultural upbringing, our background, our just general preferences, the mental models we have. So many different factors influence this. And so what we're trying to do in this sense is essentially combine the different perspectives to create a more coherent whole of the entire organization. So what I want to put to you here is that the challenge to you is to go beyond the team level. It's not enough to focus on trying to be agile inside your squads or individual teams. It's about the interactions between the parts. We need to connect the strategy to the operations and vice versa. So to recap on the system side, two points that we talked about here, visualizing the ATOs all the way from the beginning to the end, connecting your strategy. Of course, if you like to read, uh, as I suspect quite a few of you do, probably your backlog is longer uh, than the list of, or the time that you have available. Uh, but two books specifically that I can recommend in the space. Uh, the first one being Thinking in Systems by Donella Meadows, a fantastic primer on systems understanding. Uh, it, it is, and I recommend should be used as a university textbook and probably in many schools all around the world. Um, fantastic, fantastic book examples, all kinds of different situations, not just in software uh, and organizations. Uh, and of course, uh, Rethinking Agile by Klaus Leopold. Uh, this tells the story of kind of the concepts behind flight levels and tries to look at a different way of being able to do this more effectively in the organization. Cool. So that is systems. Let's take a look at science, our second lens. So science for me is really this key of observation and experimentation. And I talked about perceptions at the beginning, right? How do you understand your organization's capabilities right now? What do you see that's actually happening? And trying to make experiments to see what actually works, right? Basically, what we're trying to answer is what happens here? Something lands in done. And the question that I usually find is that the framing is essentially around this. Are we focusing on outputs or are we focusing on outcomes, right? The reality is that in many organizations, and I think Cheryl was actually talking about this, uh, it was, was it yesterday or was it this morning? Uh, it, it was yesterday, I think, yeah, because I, I saw the part of the talk, uh, collecting uh, all about the underpants gnomes. Uh, hopefully some people get the South Park reference, but essentially, what we do in our organizations is that we kind of assume that collecting as many underpants as possible uh, is the best thing to do, but we very rarely look at step two, which is the way that we get to profit. We just assume that we are going to achieve this outcome, and we don't really pay too much attention or enough attention, in my opinion, to how that happens. I want to say a quick shout out to Patrick Stayert, who recommended this book to me. It's one of my favorite reads of the last few years, uh, The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. Uh, and in here, he talks about this concept of how the human mind is a story processor more than a logic processor. And what that means basically is that we tend to make a decision and then use our rational thinking ability to construct a reason why we made the choice. We don't so much think rationally first and then arrive at a conclusion. Okay. We use our rational ability to explain the conclusions we have already right, made, like right? This is a challenge. We need to somehow overcome this. 
another example is from Annie Duke. Uh, she talks in her wonderful book, Thinking in Bets, uh, about this concept called resulting, where what we tend to do is evaluate the quality of a decision based on whether or not it yielded a good outcome, right? Now, her background is in poker. And the reality is that in many cases, you could have played a completely stupid hand, just got extremely lucky, and then won. And so you start to build up this narrative that I'm amazing, I'm successful, I'm making good choices. In reality, not so much the case, yeah? So, this. the simplest thing that I think we need to get in the habit of doing is starting to write down our hypotheses before we start. If this thing happens, or if we do this thing, I expect some kind of an outcome. And the goal here is not to try to be right. The goal is to try to learn. So the question is what happens? And then let's reflect because the delta or the difference between what we expected and what actually happened, this is our opportunity to learn. So if you're wondering how to do this, uh, some simple ways is to write down simply the answer to this and a second question I will share in a second. If we had this today, what would the benefit be? How many customers would sign up? How many people would call the, the customer care center? How much easier would the experience be? Quantify it, try to put it in tangible real terms, yeah? What would the benefit be? Another opportunity is to look at it from this way. What assumptions would need to be true in order for this to work, yeah? What would happen? We would need to have this, that would need to be true, and so on. So quantify your hypothesis before you start and reflect as you go. I showed you this picture earlier. If you're the kind of person who is struggling in an organization who is typically exhibiting this behavior of saying, but there's still space, we could squeeze in one extra little thing. And I grant you, I, I, I fully acknowledge that this is an extremely hard thing to solve uh, at an individual level. I have more books in progress than I should. Uh, and I know this theory probably better than I should admit, uh, given uh, how many I have in flight. Uh, we all face this challenge, right? But the simple heuristic and help, uh, hack that I have found that is helpful for this uh, is to use a concept that I, I got straight from Spotify. This is a tribe that I worked with. Uh, there were about 85 people working across this board uh, at the time that this photo was taken. Uh, it's a single, in flight levels terminology, level two system uh, that basically visualizes all the things that are on the go. On the right-hand side, just to draw your attention, the green notes are labeled current bets. And basically what this is, this is a ranked list of things from the organization that says these are the most important initiatives for us. Now, a lot of organizations have something that is kind of like a ranked list. Uh, in many cases, they have more than one ranked list. The challenge with this is that we're essentially trying to resolve the question of given two options, which one should we do? The heuristic that I like for this is don't let number three block number one, right? So if I'm busy on number one and you're asking for my help, I can say, sorry, dude, I'm busy with number one. Or if I'm working on number three and I need your help, you're working on number one, I know not to interrupt you because it's quite likely that your work is more important than mine. I will say in my experience, I think it's more important that you have a number one and you worry so much about which one is number one, it will almost always be either extremely obvious which it is, or quite frankly, it doesn't matter. Just finishing something by using this heuristic will be better than trying to do it all in one go. So if we do this, we can start to avoid making worse traffic jams. These things are not super helpful inside our organizations, and I think this is a good place to start. If you want to explore this topic a bit further, uh, two books that I can strongly recommend. Uh, the first one is Escaping the Build Trap uh, by the wonderful Melissa. Talks about management framework uh, for strategy within your organization. Uh, if you're finding this topic really interesting, highly recommend it. And of course, the other one, uh, Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke. I did mention this a little bit in detail earlier. Um, grab a shot of this. Cool. So to summarize, we said quantify our hypothesis, uh, write, reflect, and learn as we go, yeah? 
And don't let number three block number one. So that brings us to our third lens that can help us to move beyond this copy paste world. This one is one that is especially close to my heart and I find it quite fascinating. This idea of humans and our wonderful diversity, the variety of different ideas and perspectives that we have that create the possibility for us to come together and learn fascinating things. The challenge is, however, that I often hear this statement, maybe some of you have heard this, but people resist change. And just a show of hands, have you heard this or maybe you've, you've even said it uh, at some point in your life, yeah? Or maybe the slightly more dangerous version of this, uh, which is basically, they won't work unless we tell them what to do. Um, the challenge with this for me is that it kind of makes the assumption that people are either lazy or not very good at what they do, right? They're essentially kind of dead wood in the organization. And, and I put it to you that if you have dead wood in your organization, there's really only two ways that it got there. You either hired dead wood or you hired live wood and you killed it, right? Both of these two things are your responsibility to fix. Part of the challenge I think stems from it, really the core foundations of how we tend to think about our organizations and systems is that we tend to think about it like this. We use machine models, right? We think of one part as interchangeable with another. We can pull out a gearbox from one car and we put another similar one in and it will just work, right? You can change your tires, uh, you can refuel, you can get a service, this kind of a thing. Human beings and organizational systems and social systems do not work like this. If you want a better metaphor for this, I like this one, forestry, right? Gardening and plants. If you want to produce a forest like this, firstly, you need a little bit of patience, but what you can do is you can start to influence the environment. You can water at the right time, plant at the right time. Don't, do much, don't give too much sun, don't give too little sun. It's all about balances and feedback loops. For sure, we know that you cannot set a quarterly KPI and a target for a tree and say, you will grow this much by the end of the quarter. And if it doesn't, you shout and scream at it and hope that that's going to work, right? We know that this doesn't work with trees. Hopefully, by now, we all know that this also doesn't work for, with humans. Another piece of the challenge here, though, and I'm wondering maybe some of you have an idea. What is going on in this picture? Does anybody know what's happening here? I think it's a panel on women's health. You are most correct, unfortunately. This is Mike Pence, uh, and they are basically, the, I forget, the, they have some complicated name for it, but they are basically deciding on women's rights and women's health, right? Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I don't think that there's any possibility, aside from, put aside your political opinions about the specific people in the room, but a group of white men, not likely to make a very good decision about women's health. It's not that they are completely oblivious, but they probably have no direct experience with the situation, right? If your meetings tend to look like this, you have some challenges and some problems that you need to start addressing. Who can tell me what's going on here? Does anyone know this? That was the Indian um, space the rocket launch, isn't it? I don't know which one. So when I first saw this, I, I very much thought that this was something like a family reunion or maybe a wedding, uh, something like this, because my, my biases and my assessment of, of what people who look and dress like this would be doing uh, was not launching a, a Mars orbiter. Uh, these are the, the predominantly female team uh, who work for the ISRO, the Indian Space Agency, uh, launching a space shuttle affectionately known as the Mangalayan. Um, it is an amazing feat of engineering. Uh, they did it for a tenth of the cost and they did it on their first launch attempt ever. They've done it for less money and in less time than anybody did it before or since. It is insanely Im Im impressive achievement. Um, this is not typically what we think of when we see uh, a group of Indian women in this kind of a setting. Uh, and I think it's a fantastic story. 
because what it illustrates is a little bit of what our biases are capable of. I want to tell you a little bit of a background of well, where does this come from? Well, the short version is that many years ago, our ancestors were roving around uh, on the continent that I'm originally from, uh, and something like this would come charging out of the bush, uh, and we had to make quite a quick decision. If we were sitting there looking at it going, well, it looks yellow, kind of fluffy, it's moving quite fast, it's coming in my general direction, definitely looks fairly hungry. By this point, we are already lunch, right? We had to do what we call a fast fit pattern match rather than a best fit pattern match, as Daniel Kahneman talks about. We need to see something and react. So we have this somewhat built into our biology. We see certain people, we see certain plants, we hear loud noises, we jump out of fright. All of these things come from essentially the same kind of a place, right? So if we need, need to acknowledge that this is a thing, what I think that we can do is we can try to intentionally design around some of the biases that we have. And I'll give you a couple of examples in a minute. But if you remember from this slide, what we're trying to do is we're trying to see the value and the benefits of the variety of different perspectives that could be brought into the room to understand the situation more coherently. So if you're all like this, as in white, male, maybe, I heard it once as pale, male and stale actually, which uh, I thought was a fantastic framing uh, for this collection of humans. Uh, but if you're all men, if you're all from South Africa, if you're all engineers, if you're all product managers, if you're all senior leadership, invite some people from a different background into that mix. Get some different roles, get some people who come from somewhere different, speak a different language. You will be amazed by the perspective that happens as a result. If you have a scenario where meeting a leader feels like you're the kid on the right instead of the person on the left, uh, or if you notice that you are the person on the left, and you're making other people feel like the kid on the right, this is an opportunity to address. Maybe making suggestions could feel like this, or if your retrospectives feel like this. Maybe restructures, I think very often do feel like this, and very commonly performance reviews can feel like this. As I said, we're not going to get the benefit of the diverse perspectives. A nice framing, to be able to think about this is if diversity is being invited to the party, what we're talking about here is inclusion. So inclusion is choosing the music. It's taking it a step further. It's not just enough to say, you can come in. We have to make people feel that they belong and that they are welcome in this space. A couple of practical examples of how you can do this from my own experiences. Very often, organizations tend to have a strong bias towards written or towards verbal, right? Mostly, in my experience, it's verbal. The challenge with this is that you don't get an opportunity to pre-read. People don't usually get very much time to think about something afterwards. And very rarely do we follow up. We tend to ask questions in a very matter-of-fact way. What thoughts do you have? Okay, that's the end. Thank you. Done. Yeah? If you have this, try mix it up. Use the other side of the equation. Second example. This is a story from a group of uh, folks, again, from Spotify that I worked with. I want to draw your attention specifically to points three, four, and five. Uh, this is essentially an agenda from a monthly check-in that we would do uh, with the leadership of each tribe and squad uh, and cascading kind of uh, in sort of a coaching style. The point here was that people were asked to basically say what was on their mind what were they stressed by? And as a secondary and very distinctly important separate point, what did they need help with? Because what we'd noticed was that many of the folks who were in leadership or coaching roles assumed that something that was stressing someone out was automatically something that they needed help with. This is not always the case. So I ask you to please be careful. Do not inflict help upon people who do not want it, okay? So, if you're interested to read a little bit more about this, uh, two books that I think are fantastic uh, in helping recognize some practical ways to be able to move forward. Uh, first one, Esther Derby's fantastic book uh, came out, I think, a year and a half ago, uh, Seven Rules for Productive, Positive Productive Change. Uh, really, really fascinating. Um, highly recommend this one. Uh, and Liz Wiseman's Multipliers. Uh, this book shone a light on some certain patterns of behavior that I realized uh, that I needed to shift because good intentions don't necessarily always yield good results. So 
maybe you're listening to me uh, and realizing uh, that some of the stuff that I'm talking about could possibly uh, be interesting to you. Some of the counter arguments that I've heard uh, against this is that, well, coaching, teaching, and so on is too expensive. Uh, and in reality, yeah, it does cost some money. It does cost some time and some energy. Um, but the challenge for me is that really it sounds quite a lot like this. What if we train them and they leave? Um, which I think is, is an interesting question. Uh, but I would put it to you the other way around is what if you don't and they stay? Yeah. So we've been asking this question, how do we move beyond copy paste agile? And I think hopefully I've shone a light on the three lenses that are important to consider. There is probably a lot more here than I have time to cover in a 30 minute slot. But just to put a fine point on it, interact feed across all flight level organization, science, yeah, the shift from output to outcome by quantifying, reflecting, and learning as we go. And lastly, but by no means least, sapiens. Design around your bias to leverage the benefits of diverse perspectives. And this is what helps us to build the missing links between strategy and operational agility.